Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with an eye-popping top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic, 10 judgments in the New Testament. Wow, do we want to do this? <laughs> the topic of judgment seems a bit off-putting, doesn't it? But we do want God to set things straight, to wipe away tears, to eradicate death, and kick out the devil, and somehow put things back to the way things ought to be. God is never apologetic about his judgments. We shouldn't be either. So let's get started. Number one, the judgment at the cross. Yes, it's an interesting thing in this age of grace. We sometimes think, oh, well, we want nothing to do with the judgment, but the age of grace begins with judgment. That's what the story of the cross is. And it certainly continues with judgment. The same Lord Jesus who bore the judgment at Calvary, Paul says to the Thessalonians in the second letter, he's going to return in flaming fire, wreaking judgment. And we read in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation that the church says, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power be to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments. So they praise the Lord for his judgments. We should never be apologetic about God's judgments. He's a God who balances all the books, who sets everything straight. That's the kind of God he is. He doesn't leave things undone. So as we go to the cross, we see a threefold judgment there. First of all, we read what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own son. And what did his son come to do? He condemned sin, the word means to judge against it. He condemned sin in the flesh. But he also condemned Satan. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Satan is still running loose, but the Lord knocked him from his horse and defeated him there at Calvary. And then thirdly, he condemned the world. Paul says, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So the Lord dealt with sin, the devil, and the world in a threefold judgment at the cross. If I want to see what the world is like, don't look at Hollywood, don't look at New York, look at Calvary, and you'll see the world exposed for what it is in opposition to the Lord Jesus. Then number two, the judgment of the believer as a sinner in the past. There's a threefold judgment of the believer, and the first one is this, I was judged at the cross in Christ, my substitute. So Paul writes to the Romans, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So all that I was BC, before Christ, has been executed. When the Bible speaks about the old man, that's what it's referring to. So the full extent of the law has been exercised against my old man, and so there's nothing left to deal with. My sin has been dealt with in full at the cross. The next one having to do with the believer, number three, the judgment of the believer as a son in the present. Judgment begins at the house of God. And so he has dealing with us. Sometimes we look at the unbelievers and say, they seem to be getting away with things. But like my dad used to say to me, when I'd say, well, Johnny, he gets to do that. And he would say, look, I'm not Johnny's father, right? I had a responsibility for my own children. And so God is dealing with his children at the present time, not as criminals. That was all dealt with when I put my trust in Christ. But now he's child training me. And the writer to the Hebrews explains that this child training proves three things. Number one, it proves my relationship. He doesn't discipline other people's children. And if I'm not being disciplined when I consistently sin, 
I better check and see whether I'm an illegitimate child. I'm not related to God at all. So relationship. Secondly, his love for us. It's a manifestation of his loving care that he puts me through these periods of child training. And then thirdly, his plan for me. He's not satisfied with where I'm at. He wants to see me like Christ. And so God is disciplining me at the present time. It's important for us to understand that idea that uh, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. In other words, every day is judgment day. And if I'm serious in looking into my own heart and seeking to be brought into alignment with God and his will, then I don't have to be afraid of external judgment because I'm taking it seriously myself. And that leads up to number four, the judgment of the believer as a servant in the future at the Bema. Right, so the judgment seat of Christ is not judging my sin, it's judging my service, my works. And it's important to make that distinction. I will not be judged, but my works will be judged, the scripture says, of what sort they are. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each may receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Now, this is not referring to bad in the sense of evil. This is dealing with the quality of the work that we have done, our motives for doing it, and how we went about doing the work of God. It's going to be a happy day. It's a reward day. And the Lord tells us that even if we give a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple to one of the least of his followers, it will not lose its reward. And God is keeping track of every handshake, every smile, every word of encouragement. It's going to be a very happy day. Will we suffer loss? I think that's true. Nonetheless, God will be compensating his people for all that they have done for him. And I think it's important that we recognize these three distinctions. The recompense, he's the Lord God of recompense. And so any expense that uh, we have incurred in the service for the Lord, he will compensate us for because he's no man's debtor. And then secondly, there's the area of responsibility. We have these three parables about the pounds and the pennies and the talents. And through this, the Lord shows us that as we have been faithful in little things, he will give us responsibility in the kingdom in great things. And so it's important for us to understand that a little thing is maybe a little thing, but faithfulness in a little thing is important because on that basis, God will reward us with responsibilities in a coming day. And then thirdly, there's the area of rewards. And we have this idea of crowns, an imperishable crown, a crown of rejoicing, a crown of righteousness, a crown of glory, and a crown of life. And these are not status symbols in heaven. You know, I have more crowns than you. People misunderstand the reward system if they think that the glory goes to the recipient. No, the glory goes to the giver. In this picture of the 24 elders casting their crowns at his feet, they're saying, Lord, you deserve this. You took up a clay pot and put treasure into it. Somehow you accomplished your purpose through all my mistakes and all my failure and weakness. Somehow you did it anyway, and of course you get the glory. And so we should be thinking of rewards as an opportunity to give him glory for what he was able to accomplish through us in all of our weakness. And if we see that as our motivation, it's not a status symbol. It's not something that we're going to get the glory for. He's going to get the glory for everything that he's been able to accomplish through his servants. Then number five, the judgment of Babylon the Great. So Babylon in the book of Revelation is older than Rome. It's bigger than Rome. It includes Rome. It's the religious and political and economic system that men have built in opposition to God. The place where people are trying to be happy without God, using pleasure, economic incentives, political power, whatever it is, trying to find some substitute for a relationship with God. And it's 
picture it as this great system that has been built up in opposition to God. And the scripture says that during the first half of the tribulation, this system will grow until eventually it encompasses the world. And then the Lord will step in. During the last half of the tribulation, God uh, tells us that Babylon, this great antichrist, the leader of the system, will break his covenant with the Jews and we'll see the rapid destruction of the system as it begins to collapse. And of course, we have the picture of Christ, the stone carved out without men's help, hurtling through space like a wrecking ball and smashing Babylon to pieces, to dust, in order to prepare for the coming kingdom of Christ. So this is a, a time, Revelation 17 and 18, describe the end of Babylon and the recurring theme, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Imagine everything that man has built up in opposition to God, in one hour it's going to be dust and ashes. Number six, the judgment of the Antichrist, also called the beast and the man of sin, the false prophet, all called another beast, and the devil. This is the false trinity. You know, the devil is not creative. He's simply adaptive, and he takes God's ideas and produces counterfeits. And so the devil has always wanted to be God and to put himself above the throne of God. And so he is called the God of this world, but then he is going to introduce this man of sin or man of, of lawlessness called the Antichrist. It won't simply be against Christ, it will be an alternative to Christ, the devil's alternative. And he will have this death wound so that he appears to have this credential to be the true Messiah. And the Bible tells us that two-thirds of the Jews will side with him, but one-third will stand against him waiting for the true Messiah. And so the Antichrist is going to be judged along with the false prophet. The false prophet takes the role of the Holy Spirit seeking to woo people to the Antichrist who is going to cause people to worship the devil himself. And so this triumvirate of evil, the devil acting as God, the Antichrist acting as the Savior, and the false prophet acting as the Holy Spirit. They will all be exposed for what they are, and they will be cast out into the bottomless pit and judged. Number seven, the sheep and goats judgment. Yes, this happens after the Lord Jesus has defeated the forces of Antichrist, the Battle of Armageddon, he returns to Jerusalem. He sits on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem and before him is the north end of the Kidron Valley, the Valley of Concision, the place where there's going to be a separation of sheep and goats. The goats will go to his left over towards Gehenna, Gehenna, one of the names Jesus used for hell, the place of burnings, and the sheep will go over to the side where Calvary is on the north side of the city. So the Lord Jesus will separate out the sheep and goats. This will be the judgment of the nations based on how they treated his brethren, the Jewish people. And some will be sent immediately to judgment and some will be allowed into the kingdom that he is ready to establish with its base in the city of Jerusalem. And then number eight, the judgment of the remnant of the Jewish nation. So we talked about how two-thirds of the Jews will side with the Antichrist and one-third will be waiting for the Messiah. Isaiah 53 describes this. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. We thought that Jesus was someone under the judgment of God, but he was wounded for our transgressions. They'll look on him whom they pierced. They'll recognize that the Messiah they've been waiting for is the Jesus they crucified and they will personally accept him. They'll receive him as savior. Now, it seems that at that point, it will be almost impossible for these Jewish people to believe that there's enough in the cross to pay for the cross. In other words, 
how could God ever forgive his own people for taking the Messiah, which he had painstakingly revealed through the prophecies as to what he would be, where he would be born. Daniel tells us when he would come into the world, describing these uh, 483 years from the dedication of the temple in Nehemiah chapter 2 until Messiah would come. God had laid out this plan, what kind of person he would be, the kind of miracles he would do, and they couldn't see it. They didn't recognize him, and they rejected him. And is it true that God could forgive them for murdering their own Messiah? And so we read in Zechariah that a fount of cleansing will be open for the house of Israel. This will not be a fresh shedding of the blood. This will not be another sacrifice but a fresh demonstration of the value of the cross of Christ. And so it will be a fulfillment of the great day of atonement, which the Jews have practiced, Yom Kippur, year after year. This will be the true day of atonement, when the sins of Israel will be put away, and in the words of the Apostle Paul, all Israel will be saved. That is, all of the Jews who are still living after the destruction of the forces of Antichrist, every Jew at that point will recognize the Messiah and will be saved. And they will be the nation born in a day, Ezekiel's Valley of Dry Bones, where before our eyes, the nation of Israel will be restored now with Christ as their king priest, and they will enter into their own city, and they will become the head of the nations instead of the tail. It's going to be a glorious day when the Lord does that. The number nine, the great white throne judgment. This is a frightening chapter in the history of the world. This is the final assize. And at this point, it should be understood that there are two phases to a trial. There's first of all the, the phase at which they're determined to be guilty or innocent. And then there's a second phase when the judgment will be decided, what will actually be the sentence. And all of the people who stand before the great white throne have already been found guilty. Their names are not in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, and they're under God's judgment. Then the books will be open to assess how much light they've had, how much responsibility they've had, the damage that they have done to others around them, and so on. And then the Lord Jesus, who's sitting on the great white throne, will determine their judgment and what they will face in eternity. So it's a very solemn thing. Believers will not be there. This is all those whose names are not in the Lamb's Book of Life. And these are people who, according to John 3, are condemned already. Their mouths will be gagged. They're not going to make some kind of clever appeal. They're already found guilty, and what a solemn thing it will be when the Lord finally brings judgment to those who have rejected his offer of mercy. The same one who says today, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, is the same one who will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, and he will send them away to judgment. Well, wow. and then uh, number 10, the judgment of angels by believers. I don't really know what this is about. We're not told very much. But as we read through and we think about these judgments, we realize that many of them have practical implications for us now. Obviously, the child training, the discipline, the bema, the time of rewards, the fact of the great white throne judgment should spur us in evangelism to reach out to people and to warn them to flee from the wrath to come. And uh, certainly the whole idea of how we treat the nation of Israel relative to the sheep and goats judgment. But here the judgment of angels also has a very practical outworking in our lives. Paul is talking about how we deal with other believers in our local churches. And, and he says, look, don't you uh, take a brother to court because you're going to appear before a pagan largely an unbeliever how do you think that they will make a, a fair judgment about your situation if you feel you've been wronged by a brother perhaps in business 
you should be able to go before the court of the church if you insist, instead of just taking your lumps. But don't you think about going before a pagan judge. Don't you know that you're going to judge angels, he says? So in other words, taking your case before someone who is not illuminated by the Spirit of God, who is working in the dark, you can't expect fair judgment there. You'd be better bringing it before the Christians in your local church. But he says, there's a day coming when we will judge angels. And this brings back to us this amazing truth that a man was made a little lower than the angels. The Lord Jesus, in order to save us, we read, he passed the angels on the way down, his creatures, and he took a position with humanity. But when he rose from the dead, he rose up past the angels again, and this time he took our humanity with him above the angels. And now we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies above the angels, and the angels are now ministering servants to us. They were servants to God through the centuries, but now they're ministering servants to us. And there's a day coming when we, in that role, and I don't know what this means, but we will be in a position of actually making decisions relative to the angels. So it just reminds us on the one hand of the lowly submission of Christ to come beneath the angels and of the glorious exaltation of God's people to be seated in the heavenlies above the angels and our responsibility to deal wisely with one another now and to seek the wisdom that's from above so that we can deal with one another in a way because someday we're going to be judging angels, whatever that means. But it brings us back to this main idea, God likes things done right. And when they're not done right, he sets them right. And we ought to have that same attitude. If we've done things that are wrong, we ought to seek to set them right. Because we don't want them all showing up where the Lord's going to have to sort everything out at the judgment seat of Christ. Nobody's going to cross the golden street to avoid another believer in heaven. Everything's going to be set right. There are some things we can set right now, let's do it. But everything is going to be set right. And we're going to step into that wonderful age without regrets, without impediments, without offenses between brothers and sisters. It's going to be a wonderful day when the Lord's got all the books balanced and everything clear, and the Lord Jesus will get the glory for this because all judgment has been delivered into his hand, and he's the one who's going to set everything right before one final assize. 1 Corinthians 15 describes how the Lord will submit to one final audit and God the Father will examine everything the Son has done and says, Son, you've done it perfectly. And then we will step into that glorious age, every tear wiped away, every problem solved, every regret forever resolved, and we will forever live in a world where righteousness dwells, not where he will exercise it with a rod of iron as during the millennium, but in the world to come, Everyone will be happy with the way God does things. Everyone will agree with him. We'll never have an opposing view. And everything at last will be right.